Hi everyone, welcome back to my Z80 computer series. So what's all this then? Well, I'm turning my attention to the VGA output. Um, I think that's going to be one of the more difficult aspects of the project. So I want to start to dip my toe in the water, just experimenting really. I'm not sure if this is a route that I'm going to continue with, but it's a route I'm going down just to experiment and play around. Um, I'll briefly sort of talk about the setup I've got here. I've got the uh, bench power supply here, giving me a, a five volt supply. I'm going to limit the current to one amp. So if anything goes wrong, hopefully um, with a limit of one amp, we might be able to save some of the chips, who knows, um, rather than just allowing unlimited current to flow through if I accidentally short something out. Um, I've then got my oscilloscope here it's actually a four channel scope i'm only going to be using two channels today um, but those uh, four channels might come in handy in the future um, and basically what i'm experimenting with here on the breadboard is um, essentially ben eater's design of the world's worst video card um, i don't like calling it that because i think it's a, a great design um, but it is pretty limited in what it can do. But the reason I wanted to look at Ben Eater's design is because I found his was the easiest to understand what was going on. Not sure if this is going to be too limited and whether or not this is even going to work, but I thought I'd have a play around with it just as a starting point. I've got some idea of where I want to be with um, graphics capabilities for this machine, but I think I'm a long way off achieving those. So I just want to start small and just get something on the screen. Um, just to point out we won't be getting anything on the screen today. I'm just looking at VGA timing signals. Now it's pretty difficult for me to explain everything on this breadboard um, without kind of building it up bit by bit as we go. And I've actually got everything on here. It took me quite a bit of time to get everything working. I had some, some issues with it. I want to explain one of the issues that I hit, um, but essentially, it's, it's Ben Eater's design, so if you have a look at his um, videos and his website, he's got a schematic there that you could follow. Um, I haven't followed his schematic exactly, and that's kind of what I want to get into. So just roughly, here I've got a, a 10 megahertz um, oscillator. Um, you just give it a, a 5 volt supply on the top left and a ground the blue wire here on the on the bottom right and then that gives us out um, of the top right because it's a four pin device and the top right pin gives you the clock signal at 10 megahertz now we should be able to put a scope on that um, if I move this over to here um, let me power up. If you look on the scope, what happened? It's the uh, channel two, so we're looking at the blue, the blue signal. And which way do I want to go? There we go. There's so the blue signal there. Let's get rid of the yellow if I can. Yeah, and. That is our 10 megahertz signal. I'm struggling a little bit with the, the scope. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna change that over to um, channel one, just because of my lack of knowledge on the on this scope. Let's take that out of there. Let's put channel one in there. Let's get back to channel one on the scope. There we go, get rid of the channel two and yep there we go 10 megahertz I don't know if you can see that there 10 10 megahertz and it should tell us down here 10 megahertz so that's the signal coming out of the clock um, let's go back to the let's go back down to the breadboard so I've got three counter chips here they're four bit counter chips there's a uh, one two and three um, they're cascaded together to give us a 12 bit counter we're only using nine bits um, the bits uh, come out of the top here there's four on each um, but we're only using nine we're using four here four here and one on this one 
And basically we, we pick off the bits that we want um, for the numbers that we're interested in, the particular counts where we want to do things. And we bring them down to these chips at the bottom here. Now these are eight input NAND gates. There's four of them, one, two, three, and four. Um, we don't need all eight inputs on all of the chips, but the eight inputs give us um, enough space for everything we need. And then ultimately out of each one, you get the count you get a signal for the count that you're you're looking for um, and it comes out of the top right pin so i've tried to color code my wiring i know it doesn't look like it because i couldn't quite achieve it but um all the orange wires are going into to this nand gate and they've ultimately come out of this orange wire here um, and that's our 200 count we'll look at the timings in a second um, and then we get the green one coming out of here that's our 210 count and that's going up here um, and then we get the yellow one that is the 242 count um, that's going up to here and then finally the white one on the last chip here this is our 264 count and that's coming over to here now these two chips where those um, signals are going into are the SR latches but the the chips are actually uh, quad NAND gates, I believe, quad NAND gates, um, and they've just been configured in a way to create an SR latch. Now I'm, I've used two chips and I've realized I could have done it all with one chip because we, for an SR latch we need two NAND gates and we've got four on each chip, so I could have done um, the two SR latches, I could have built it all on one chip. Um, that's what Ben Eater's design actually does, so I should have followed that a bit closer but I didn't, um, I'd done them on separate chips. Um, and I had no problems uh, with this one. Now this one is coming from the um, the 210 and the 264 counts, the 210 and the 264 counts. Um, and that tells us basically when we are in the display region and there was no problem with that one. Um, but this one over here, I ran into an issue and it was actually getting really hot. Um, so hot, actually, I burnt my finger by touching it. And when I took the chip out, I realized it actually melted the, the breadboard. You can't see it here. It's not a problem, still works. Um, but the, the breadboard is melted under that chip there. Um, and I want to go into that, into um, why that happened. Um, kind of my fault, but there was a suggestion on Benita's site saying that you could exclude the inverters now i haven't explained the inverters um, normally we have inverters sitting in between the signals coming out of the count and the signals going into the nand gate now when we want to look at the ones um, on the binary number that we're looking for we can just take the signal straight to the to the um, eight input nand gates but when we want to look for a zero we have to go through an inverter and then take it into the and NAND gates and in Ben Eater's design he's got an inverter on every single line um, so you can look at either the one or the zero um, but on his website it suggested that you don't need those inverters you can just pick off the ones and just bring the ones into the NAND gates and it should work um, well it does for um, the first one and the fourth one um, but there's a bit of a conflict if you do that on the the second and the third so I'll show you the numbers and show you why that is the case. Okay, now this is uh, a diagram of the, the timing that we're trying to generate, the timing, timing signal for the horizontal sync pulse. Now, uh, please excuse the crudity of my diagram. I didn't have time to draw it to scale or to paint it. Um, what we've got here is we need the sync pulse to go low at very specific um, intervals and um, with the 10 megahertz signal um, we need to be setting the sync pulse low i believe it's low i'm not sure if it should be high actually maybe it should be drawn the other way around um, but we need it to basically switch uh, after 210 counts of that 10 megahertz signal um, and then we need it to switch off again at 242 counts. So this is the, the important region for the purpose of the horizontal sync pulse. This is what the monitor wants to see, these very specific timings. 
Um, but we're also, with the circuit we've built up, we can also tell whether or not we're in the display region here. Um, this is the display region. This is what's known as the front porch. That's the horizontal sink pulse. And then this bit here is the back porch. Um, but we want to know when we're in the display region. Um, and we want that to basically um, turn on and off um, when we hit the 200 count and the 264 count because the 264 count resets. So 264 and zero are the same thing or the same time. Um, so if we switch at 264 and 200, we'll know when we're in the display region. And if we also switch at 210 and 242, we'll know when we're in the horizontal sync pulse. So that's what we're trying to aim for. We're trying to generate this um, timing that we want to see on the on the scope. Now, if we look at the binary numbers for each of these counts, 200, 210, 242, and 264, I've worked them out and written them down here. These are the decimal numbers, and these are their binary equivalent binary equivalents. Um, you can see we need a nine bit number because 264, um, we do need this last bit here. This ninth bit or bit eight if we're counting from from zero if i put the bit numbers on here um, we've got bit zero uh, bit one bit two bit three bit four five six seven and eight nine bits um zero to eight um, these bits we can pick off the first of our counters these these blocks, this block of four here, we can pick off the second counter. And then this very last bit, we pick off the third counter. Now, what's interesting is um, no problem with the 200 and the 264. Um, if we just look at the, the ones, um, we can see that we can, by the time we count up to this number to where this bit gets set, which will, um, all three of these ones will only happen um, once we hit the number 200, it will never happen before that. Um, and um, if we look at how far we're going with 264, um, we can see this is the highest number we'll ever get to. Um, and that will never set um, bit 6 and 7, will never get never get set again after the number 200. So it is safe just to pick off the, the, three, the three ones and put them through a NAND gate. Um, that will only ever happen at the number 200 or count 200. Um, but there's a problem here with these two. Um, you can see that if we just um, test bits 1, um, 4, 6 and 7, which are the, every time these are 1s, bit 1, 4, 6 and 7, um, that will happen at count 210, but it will actually happen again at count 242. If you look at these ones, the very same bits get set here, here, here and here. So there's a clash, and we'll see that on the oscilloscope in a second. Um, so we do actually have to make sure that when we're looking at count 210, we do have to make sure that this bit here is actually a zero, because if we're not looking at it, it, it could be a one, and we could actually be at count 242. And what the problem is, is um, we have our set and reset latch, um, and we'll actually be... Um, thinking that we're at the, the 210 when we're actually at 242 and we'll be trying to both set for 210 and reset for 242 at the same time and I think that's what made the chip very unhappy um, and it got really hot. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the, the problematic SR latch from my circuit and I'm going to remove the inverter that I added to show you the um, original problem I had and we'll look at the signals on the scope. So I can test when it's a zero by inverting it, which will turn it into a one and then send it to the, the NAND gate over here. But what I'm going to do instead of doing that, I'll remove this wire and I'll just, um, we, we essentially won't be testing that bit anymore because it's not going into the NAND gate, but we will need to um, pull that bit on the NAND gate, um, which I believe was there. Mm, yep, we'll need to pull that high as I've got my red line down the bottom, my red rail. I'll just plug that in there and take that bit high. So all the unused bits here uh, are pulled high on these um, links. Um, I apologize for the colors. Um, I've used a mix of um, different colors here, but they're all actually connecting to the red rail 
and pulling all the spare inputs to the NAND gates high um, so we're only actually looking at the signals we're interested in bring the power back in and I'll put the scope on the signals I'm interested in are the set and reset um, for this SR latch that I removed so I'm going to move my scope over to here and the other one this signal so the scope is now connected the two channels on the scope are now con connected to the set and reset of that SR latch and there that's the exact problem I was seeing if you look at that um, it actually looks like uh, two identical sets of signals um, and one of those is the 242 count and one is the 210 count we're actually getting the 210 count wrong because we're not looking at bit um, 5. So these signals are basically switching at the same time. So we're trying to both set and reset uh, that latch both at the same time. Um, if I zoom out a little bit, see if we can see anything else going on here. Yeah, so you can kind of see over here that... Um, Sometimes um, it's okay, and some, but sometimes we've got a, a clash on that on that signal. I wonder if I can uh, if I can position that a little better for us to see that. Okay, so now I'll put the inverter back in. Um, I'll dangerously try and do it whilst it's powered on. If I can get that over to there. And there we go. If I can get the wiring. Now you can see that um, these are switching at, at different times. I have to say these uh, signals are slightly confusing me, but um, I can see that they're no longer clashing with each other. I'm not quite sure also what's going on with the scope. There's sort of some, some ghosting going on. I think there's a triggering problem with the scope, and I haven't quite figured that out yet. If anyone can give me any advice on what I'm doing wrong with the scope, that would be very much appreciated. But basically, that's that's the problem I was having, um, and yeah, we now can see that we're no, we're not we're no longer switching at the same time. We're now switching at different times. Um, I'm assuming that this is like the two ten count, and this is the the two four two count. So with the inverter back in place, I've um, got the probes now pointing at the outputs of this circuit. And the uh, channel one, the yellow lines, um, this should only be high when we're in the visible area. And I've measured here, or I've turned on the measurement for the, the width of the um, channel one is saying um, 20 microseconds. It's jumping a little bit from 20 to 20.1, but the number we're looking for is 20 microseconds as per the VGA timings. And then I've also measured the width of the, the blue pulses there on channel 2, which is the horizontal sync pulse, and I'm measuring that at 3.2 microseconds, which is exactly what the monitor would be expecting as per the timing specifications. Now there's a couple more... Um, things that we're interested in is the front porch and the back porch but to measure those um, we need to zoom in a little bit so 
So the front porch will be the time between um, when we come out of the, the display timings um, and before we hit the um, horizontal sync pulse. So basically the, the space in between here will be our front porch. And if I turn on the cursors, And then I believe I can position the first cursor, if I can get the correct control. Yeah, here we go. So if I position the first cursor, I'll just pull that over a little so you can see it a bit more. About there. And then the second cursor, should be able to bring that in. So about there and that should be I believe that's BX minus AX um, which it's saying I don't know if you can read the screen but it's saying it is 1.02 microseconds but that's just as accurate as how I've positioned the cursors if I put it there look we're about in line with everything and we've got um, one microsecond, which is exactly what the front porch should be. And then we could move that over and look at the back porch, which is over here. About there, and yeah. How do we do this? There we go, I'm gonna to have to move that again. So it's from there to there. And that is saying BX minus AX. It's saying 2.18 microseconds. And we're looking for 2.2 microseconds for the back porch. So again, probably you know, it's about as accurate as I positioned the cursors. That is pretty much 2.2 microseconds. So I'm pretty happy with all the timings now. Um, this looks like it's working correctly for the horizontal sync timings. Um, I've got to decide where to go next with this circuit because although I'm quite pleased with that, so I can turn the light on. Is that a little better? Yeah, so although I'm quite pleased with that, there's there's quite a lot of chips here. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten chips. And this is just for the horizontal sync timing. We would have to produce pretty much all of this again for the vertical sync timing. Um, now I can reduce the chip count by one, in theory, by taking out this SR latch and wiring it over here to the top of this one. So I think that's what I'm going to do next, just to prove to myself I'm happy that that works. Um, but then I've got to think about how can I build another one of these circuits. Now I do have another breadboard here, so I could build up the, the vertical timings on, on this. But what I found before, when I used this board before, which is quite annoying because I, I 3D printed this um, case to put them in and stuck the two breadboards in there to make a nice big board for myself. But what I found is that um, these uh, Elegoo breadboards are not very good their holes are a little bit too big and the connections are loose and I just had so much trouble working on this I just kind of gave up with breadboards um, whereas these boards um, do seem a little better but I haven't got enough of them another option is I have this prototyping board and this is a soldered solution um, it's quite nice because you get um, common rails that run through that could be used for the power or ground um, and then you could um, position chips across here and you get these um, like connections that come out so they would be um, kind of, I could so I could get quite a few chips along here um, but then of course you can't just start putting chips in the next row because they would be um, connected to the row above by these rails so you kind of have to miss a row and then start putting more chips um, so actually 
can only really use two rows and I'm not sure how many um, chips I could get across this so I don't know if I could get um, all the chips on here for both the horizontal and the vertical timing It'd be quite a lot of chips I am wondering whether you know building it with this discrete logic chips is a, is a bad idea just for the sheer number of chips required but um, it's not too bad we need we need about 10 for the horizontal and about 10 for the vertical so we would need 20 ICs but that would be pretty much it we would need a few more chips to be able to interface it into the computer but um, it wouldn't get you know excessively out of hand um, so I think it's doable I'm just not sure if it's the, the correct approach and I don't know how much time I want to waste with prototyping um, I think what I'm going to do is see how many chips I could get on this and see if I think it is practical um, because the other thing is um, th this is just uh, a very low resolution display um, and I, I probably want to look at something different for a more high resolution display and I'd just be throwing this thing away if I built this up and that's with the um, SR latch removed here and the the signals moved down to this SR latch so I'm using just the one um, chip for the two different SR latches and I've, I've checked and the signals all look good still so this would be the chip count so I think I'm gonna see if I can go with this board um, see how many chips I can fit on this board I'm just gonna work it out before I actually start soldering actually I've been thinking about this um, I've built it up on the back of the board just to show you the, the tracks, but obviously they, these sockets would go on the other side. Um, I can put the chips close together like this. I would just have to cut through the, the tracks, just cut through the tracks to make sure they're not shorted out from one chip to another. And then I can position the chips quite compactly on here. Um, these would be the three sockets for the 12-bit the counter, the three 4-bit counters. To give us the 12-bit counter um, and then we could have uh, four of these here could be our eight input NAND gates and um, one inverter and then one SR latch which is actually a, a quad NAND gate um, to give us two SR latches on the one chip so this is everything for our horizontal sync timing and then we could probably get over here very similar amount of chips for the um, the vertical sync timing. Um, I think that would give me space in the middle to put the crystal, and then we've still got you know quite a bit of room across the top if we need additional chips to interface it with the um, the computer eventually, or even for um, the meantime some some RAM so we can display some to the screen or a ROM chip or something. Um, and I think if I position them like this, this board's a little strange. It gives you three tracks at the bottom and um, only one track at the top. And it looks like um, there's there's a common rail running down the side to sort of going through every section. Um, but these sections, these rails don't go anywhere. It's just going through to the other end of here. I guess you're supposed to link them out to whatever you want. But if I build it this way and make... Um, the one that goes everywhere, if I make that a ground, um, and then I guess I'm going to have to link some of the others up to make them positive rails. And if I do it this way round, if I put the counter chips at the bottom, their um, four bits of output is always on the top. Um, and it might be lucky that some of them might be able to go straight into the um, eight input NAND gates. So I won't have to cut the tracks for those. And then the ones where I'm unlucky, I'll just have to cut the tracks. Um, and I think that'll keep the, the connections um, quite straightforward or you know, not, not so much jumping around because um, the connections will be coming out of the top of these chips into um, majority of them going to the bottom of, of these chips. It's just um, we need four of them. So one of them will have to be um, up here or I'll have to use sort of two on here and one up there. But yeah, that, that should fit. So I'll probably go ahead and solder these on here now I don't think I've got enough sockets for the other side so I'll have to order some more sockets I tried that soldered version of a prototyping board um, but I had so many problems with it in the end I gave up 
Uh, I just kept making mistakes with the wiring and it, it got so difficult to see what was wrong. There's so many wires involved. It was uh, driving me mad in the end. So I decided I would just go and design a PCB for it. I was pretty confident in the, the timing circuit because it's it's you know, been proven by the Benita videos. So um, I was happy with that side of things and I didn't want to mess around. So I just, I just made one of these up. Um, I did, you can see I've built one up here. I did have a little bit of trouble getting it working and I've realized that I had made a couple of mistakes. It may have only been one mistake actually because I started like cutting tracks and soldering bodge wires in and then realized actually it was right in the first place and I had to start reversing it out. So it didn't actually need as many bodge wires as I've, I've put on here. Um, but there's not too many and it, it did work in the end um, so what I can do and I do have spares of these by the way if anyone's um, if anyone wants one you will have to be um, made aware of the the problems so that you can make the modifications um, but I do have spares so what I can do is this blue header here actually has the the vertical timing counts so i can actually take the signals off of these vertical counts i can i can move the wire to wherever i want them as you'll see in a minute and feed those signals into uh an or gate i believe and combine it with the the blanking signals so that we um, are only looking at it when we're not in the blanking periods and then i can take those combine signals out and feed them into these color um, signals into the monitor. So what we end up getting is horizontal lines on the screen, different colors depending on um, which color I'm feeding, depending on which count on this connection, I'm feeding into which color. We can get different colors on the screen and we can combine colors together to make other colors as you'll see. So this is uh, what I've come up with after a bit of experimenting. As I said before, the, the circuits around um, this area just weren't going to work. That design was, was no good. Um, so I've actually um, taken the, the final um, red, green and blue signals uh, that will go into the VGA. I've sort of broken them out here and taken them over to a, a breadboard. And Again, not, not very clear but those um, red green and blue are fed through three resistors one for each color um, and they're going to the outputs of, of the, a buffer chip which is here this is actually a 74HC241 and something really important to note is what I found was I was originally using an LS version so a 74LS and then whatever numbers I was using um, and I found the, the voltage levels on the LS are quite a bit lower than 5 volts um, for a high signal. I was getting um, voltages that were much lower than 5 volts. I mean, that's probably within spec for the, for the LS um, chips, but I really wanted 5 volts to, to drive these signals. Now, I'm sure it would have worked. I would just have to um, recalculate things and change the resistors. Um, but I found that if I switch to the HC version, the, the high and low signals kind of swing almost to the to the top and bottom of the power supply rails so almost up to five volts and almost down to zero volts so I am preferring the HC version of the of the chips so I've used HC versions on on everything pretty much um, what I've got here is an OR gate can't read it from here and I can't remember the number of the chip but it's a, a quad or gate 7400 logic again um, and I'm just using that to make sure that we're not outputting any pixels when we're in the blanking period so I've taken some of the the blanking signals over to the inputs of that chip and I make sure that I only actually enable the buffer when we are in the region of the screen where we're supposed to be drawing pixels and when we're not in that region, the buffer will go into high impedance state and there won't be any signals going over to the to the RGB. Now, I'll explain that circuit a bit 
better in the future and I'm likely to change it anyway so I'm not going to um, go too much into that so I'll, I'll power this on um, I've already seen it so <laughs> I'm not going to sound too excited because I've already seen it but uh, I'll show you what we're actually getting out on, on the monitor So after a bit of fiddling around, this is what I seem to have come up with. If you look at the top, starting at the top, we've got black and then blue and then red, then magenta, green, cyan, yellow, and then white. And then this cycle repeats, we go back to black again. So, I mean, it's a start. We've got some, some colored bars on the screen. We can control the color of the horizontal lines. Um, if I just move the wires onto different clock signals, we should be able to control the whip for those lines as well. So that's with um, everything moved down um, one level on the on the clock. So those lines should be half the whip that they were before. If I go down another level, so you should see they're getting thinner and thinner. So that's one more. I mean, we can still go quite away yet. So I've, I've pushed the um, connections right down to the, the lowest um, clock signals um, and that I'm now drawing on the line um, individual pixel lines, so one pixel width for the for the height of the lines. Now on the camera, it's not showing up great. You can't really see the colours anymore, but they are still there. Uh, it is it is working. It does look a little washed out with colour, a little um, probably a little too light. The sort of red reds aren't very vivid, vivid but. Um, it's it's working. Um, we can control the uh, the colours. So let's just just move that back to make it a little bit better. Yeah, there we go. Um, the lot the colours. I'm not sure what it's like on the camera for you guys, but the colours to me are, are very very bright. Now we've uh, moved up back to thicker bars. Um, so I'm 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 pleased with that. We've kind of. Uh, sorted out the the timing signals for the VGA and we can see that we can control the color um, long way to go though long way to go my next step would be to see if I can actually manipulate individual pixels as we move across the line see if I can uh, get some sort of dots or I'm not going to say characters I'm not quite ready for that yet but if I can get some different dots going across the screen um, yeah, that'll be a, a step for a step closer. Okay, so we'll leave this here. Um, thanks for watching. As always, um, if you liked the video, please um, comment, like, and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next one.